Hello and welcome to the Change Exchange. And I always uh, get my tongue tied around that one, the Change Exchange. Say it quickly, let's see if you can. Um, our guest today is Penny Haynes, that uh, we still remember as the golden girl of swimming. You're still the only woman who ever won the 100 and 200 meters breaststroke at the Olympics. Hmm? That's correct. It's quite uh, a thing. I guess it is in hindsight. At the time, you're young and you don't really realize the enormity of it. And I fully expected each subsequent Olympic Games that someone would do that. And strangely enough, it hasn't been done yet. Mm -hmm. Did you just, when did swimming become the thing in your life? I mean, as a child, one just does all kinds of sports at school. Yeah. And then, how did you grow into that? Well, I grew up along the coast. I was born in Springs, but we moved down and when I was about a year old. And if you grow up along the coast, you've got to know how to swim. So I suspect I learned around the age of two or three. Joined the school team at seven. Only really seriously began swimming for a club level at the age of 12. Um, and as my story goes, it's not because I loved swimming per se. It's more a fact of recognizing that I have talent and feeling a responsibility to really develop it to its fullest. And it became apparent that swimming was the stronger of of all the various sports that I did, mm. and uh, so I guess I went from there. And it's a it's a hard discipline. It's you put in hours and hours and hours. Hmm? It is because also it's lonely. I think the only mm. other discipline that perhaps is even harder would be gymnastics, uh, because of the injuries and stuff like that. But you know, it's it's not a team sport, and uh, even if you're a runner, you still have that interaction with your teammates. Where swimming is very lonely, but I like that. I like the solitude. What is, goes on in your head while you're doing your, your lengths? Well, it really depends. Um, I formed a habit later on while I was in college because I was so homesick. I had to find a way to focus on the here and now. And so I started counting my strokes, and, uh, which you don't do in free and back. It's a bit complicated, but in breaststroke and butterfly. So I counted my strokes, and while I did that, I focused on the details because ultimately success is really just the reflection of excellence in the details. And uh, I suppose, aside from that, uh, sometimes when you're doing the longer distances, you sing some songs or <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> but it sounds like almost a meditation. In a sense, it is. And since I retired, if I think back on my swimming career, uh, initially anyway, the part I really missed was the training, mm -hmm. that time alone and the quiet of that. Interesting. Yeah. But you were very young. You were only 17 when you left for America? That's correct. I, How I did just, that happen? Well, it was the Olympic year in 92 when I was in matric. Um, it was the first year that South Africa was readmitted into the Olympic fold. It's, it really came as a bit of a shock. I didn't really believe that we would go. I didn't grow up with the Olympic dream because we had been in isolation for so long. And then uh, some of the scouts, I guess, from America were out at our Olympic trials, offered me a scholarship. At first I said no. And then... Uh, I found out my coach at the time had contacted them and said, offer it again. So they offered it again. I did not want to go. Barcelona Why? Was Why? Well, Barcelona was incredibly disappointing for various reasons. I came 33rd, 34th, which I always joke and say it's close to last place. And so that was the first time in my career I thought it's a good idea to retire. But uh, as I sat and in the village... And you were 17? I was 17, yes. <laughs> the only school pupil on the Olympic team, as far as I know. And uh, everyone else after swimming went out and enjoyed Barcelona. I stayed behind wrestling with this idea that I have an opportunity to go to the United States. You know, I believe we're given talent and the next thing is opportunity. And what we do with that really determines our destiny. And uh, I didn't want to go. And I always stress this to my audiences because often we think when you have a desire for something, that means that's what you're supposed to do. And in my career, I found out Quite often it's the opposite. You may not have the desire. That's why whatever you do in life, you must have a deeper foundation for why you're doing it. Mm. And uh, Why didn't you want to go? Well, Nebraska is in the center of the United States. It uh, gets down to minus 20 Celsius with a wind chill factor even colder. Um, it's and this is a Durban girl. <laughs> yeah, it's a Durban girl. And you know, I always say my first nationals was in Durban. And we stayed in a hotel and I was homesick. I saw my parents throughout the day and I was still homesick. So I, I was not the kind of kid that slept out and visited you know, away from home a lot. So the idea of moving all the way to the States, and you know, it was very daunting. And plus at that time, I really didn't love swimming too much given that I'd had such a disappointing Olympics. Mm -hmm. So what, what made you decide that I'm going to take this on? 
Well, I was quite prayerful about it and just felt that if I don't go, I always wonder what if. And if I, if I don't go, I also can't tell myself or my maker that I've done the best I could with the You'll opportunity be. and the ability I had. So I had to give it a go. I kind of thought it would be one semester and then I can say, been there, done that. But uh, I realized as I went on and finally kind of settled in over there that it is a great opportunity and at times grew to really love the sport. Um, at times. At times. I think it's what? important to stress that because a lot of people think as long as you love it, then you're supposed to do it, and then when you don't, you, le you move on. And there's a lot of extremely talented people in various areas in life that are led by their emotion, and then they never really reach their true potential. So how did you handle that? Crying I mean, in my goggles? It's an incredible change for a, a young girl going out there completely by yourself? Yes. Your mother didn't go no, with no, you no, or anything? No, so. in fact, uh, it was a two-day trip. And when I arrived in Nebraska, in Lincoln, it's a tiny little airport, I arrived at 2. 3 o'clock came, 4 o'clock came, the airport was empty. 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, they remembered I was arriving. <laughs> so uh, it was very difficult the first semester. There was one other South African girl who had arrived, some other South African guys, but they were older than me, another generation of swimmers, so I really didn't know them. And I always joke and say I swam up and down crying in my goggles, which is the truth. There was no Skype or email. I couldn't just phone home. I had to wait for every second Saturday. So I lived from you know, every second Saturday to second Saturday. And that's why I say I, I realized at some point I'm wasting my time unless I change my mindset. And that's where the habit of counting strokes came in. Because if I could manage in the moment to stay here and control whatever it is I'm doing right now, because that's the only way we can be successful, you know, then I'll be able to maybe be a little happier. And as I did that, obviously I improved in my swimming. And if you improve it, whatever you're doing, you become a little more happier. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And then came 96 and uh, the, the famous uh, double victory. Yes. Did you see it coming? Did you think it was going to, might, go, might happen? No. Oh, well, I guess if someone had told me in Barcelona you'll go to the next Olympics, I would have thought they're nuts. You know, let alone go and swim a final. And I never knew that no one had done the double. If I had known, I probably wouldn't have done it, you know. So ignorance is bliss. Um, I had set some goals in 94, the second time I wanted to retire from swimming at the age of 19. And my mother said, you know, you can retire or you can choose to look at your failures and learn from them. And that could be the catapult, you know, the, the nuggets of truth you need to go on to the, your future successes. And there I set some goals for the following two years. At that swim meet in the World Champs, the, South Africa, uh, the Australian girl broke the world record. And I realized in two years' time, I could maybe attempt to swim that time, fully thinking she would continue to break the world record. And that led up to our Olympic trials in March of 96, and I broke the world record for the first time. So obviously going into the Olympics as a world go, record holder. Go back to that moment. What was, it, um, what was it like? Well, the foundation was laid pretty solidly for the two years leading up to that. And... So I knew arriving at the swim meet that I had the potential to break the world record. I'd actually just missed it the year before. Um, and I think because I just didn't plan on it happening then. Uh, I actually found out a few days before the swim that my parents were getting a divorce. So it could have shattered the goals I had. But I believe because the foundation had been laid for so long mm -hmm. beforehand, there really wasn't room for any excuses. Uh, which in itself is another very valuable lesson. Sometimes we always keep that excuse in the back pocket and then you won't reach your potential. Uh, the, the swim itself, the first 50 wasn't as fast as it should have been. So um, I still don't know today how, but I came back faster than ever before and it was a world record. And great elation, hope to break it again in the evening, but with all the commotion post world record and, and excitement of it, you know, swimming is a a sport where you need to be relaxed and find the rhythm because if you mm. tense up and try a little bit too hard you miss it which is typically what happened um, for quite a few of my initial records mm. um, until later in my career. And then um, that day at, at the 96 in Atlanta, 96 Olympics in Atlanta, the two, how far apart were the two races, the two um, finals? I think it was about two days apart. Those mm. years we still swam heats and finals. Mm. You know, now you have heats, semi-final and the final the following, following evening. Um, I had visualized that race for three months prior to the Olympics, knowing that in Barcelona I was so overwhelmed by everything. I knew going into Atlanta I can't allow myself to feel, wow, this is the Olympics. Mm -hmm. I have to consider it. It's just another event. Same race, same people I've swum over, you know, against over the last few years. And 
So I visualized the race, all the details of it, over a hundred times. So by the time I actually swam the race, it was the heats of the hundred breaststroke. It was a matter of just letting my body do what my mind had already done. And uh, it was really a sense of I can't wait to swim. I expected the other girls would be faster as well. As it turned out, they weren't as fast as I thought. So I knew going into the final, I'm safe. If I swim a 90% race, I could win. 100% I could get my record again. As it turned out, it was only 90%. <laughs> Make some mistakes in the final. Yeah. 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 And when you realized the magnitude of this, that you'd been the first women, woman to do this, um, can you remember that? Or was it I don't all think I knew emotional? until quite a bit later. You know, I, I know after being the second gold, I kind of knew a little more what to expect on the podium and to take my time walking around, you know, because they have TV on and they have ushers there rushing you along and everybody else is prepared and take their time. And I was this good little girl following the ushers. And I really, on the first gold medal, didn't enjoy it that much. I just went through the motions. Um, there's a South African hospitality area, usually at the Olympic Games, and post medal presentations and stuff, we went over there and all the media, it was just a frenzy and I didn't really know, I just went with the flow and I don't think South Africa knew what to do with me. So in a sense we were kind of pioneering um, the way forward. I was very, very fortunate that I, not by my own doing, but um, had the right people around me from the very start. Mm -hmm. One of them being Zelda von Furen, my manager at the time, now business partner. And if you don't, and this is what I see with the guys today, you don't have the right people around you. You're so young, the fame and relative money today, it's more, it really just, I suppose, could go to your head. Mm -hmm. And you're tugged in every direction and everyone wants to celebrate and it could lead to party upon party. And I think uh, maybe guys are a little safer than girls. But uh, like I say, I was really protected. And I think that allowed me to continue and have longevity in my career. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I think it might have unraveled post 96. And the, the, the relationship with South Africa, I mean, you, did you still see yourself absolutely as South oh, African? Definitely. Um, in 98, I kind of went through another one of those dips where I thought I should retire. This time I was serious. <laughs> so much to the point that Sam Ram Sammy said, listen, maybe you shouldn't swim the Commonwealth Trials. Sit out and watch and find out what it's like not to be competing. And I did that and decided I'll continue swimming and... Uh, Despite what he tried to do in terms of getting me into the team, you know, they sort of had their rules and so I couldn't go to the Commonwealth Games. At the time I was training in Canada and they offered that I could swim for Canada. As, uh, I don't know, because we're all Commonwealth, there would have been a, a way that I could have done that. But I turned it down because I felt I was born South African for a reason. And if I go that route, I could never turn back. Mm -hmm. What was it like to, I mean, South Africa was, I mean, it was flavor of the decade. Mm. Um, and we were, as a country, we were celebrated and yeah. carried on everyone's emotions. And you became one of the almost personifications of that. Did you, can one at 21, 23 feel that? Um, you know, in my case, I, I look back and I feel I was very blessed and lucky mm -hmm. that my the pinnacle of my Olympic career anyway happened in 96 post our World Cup successes during the time that Madiba was president which in itself was just amazing um, because he really took a personal interest in the athletes it wasn't a president being informed by his staff you know he knew things before some of the people around me knew in terms of um, you know achievements and baby Jakes and others had the same stories or had the same stories um, I think that because I was based in the States for so long and when the change in the country came, I really didn't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. So when we returned home, I kind of thought Josiah Tugwani would have the support of African people and maybe I would, there would still be this polarization, but there really wasn't. It was a whole nation celebrating together and that was just, it was amazing. Um, I still don't have the words for it. Um, I'm very grateful like I say, for the timing of my career and for the people of South Africa. And uh, I, I suppose I didn't see myself as really bearing the flag in that way. But in hindsight, as I mm. say, with age, you, you grow to appreciate it. And then you were barely, what, 25 yeah. when you finally decided, I'm out of here. Yeah, I, I had, um, well, 21 with the 96 Olympics. And then sort of post-Olympics, I'd come home and it was this, great big hype. 
And I always say that in Joburg Airport, everyone knew who I was. And then I went back to America, and no one knew who I was. And I went to Lincoln, Nebraska, and I didn't know who I was. You know, your identity changes, or your sense of identity changes, because it's dictated by the reaction of other people. And as athletes, we shouldn't, but we find our identity, at least at some stage of our career, in our sporting achievements. Mm. And now I had the double gold, the world record, more than I had imagined. My coach, which didn't make it easier, had been offered a position in Canada, partially because of the recommendation I'd given. They thought I'd follow, but I decided not to. So essentially, I was in Nebraska on my own, without a coach. They had someone assigned, but he wasn't going to tell the double Olympic gold medalist what to do. So I was more the coach. And that didn't really work out well. So I reached a stage in 98 where I absolutely hated swimming. I would go to the pool and get physically ill. And that was just before the Commonwealth Trials. Once I had decided, again very prayerfully, to go to Canada and continue my career, I had then decided it would be up until 2000. Oh. So my decision to retire had nothing to do with performance or anything other than the fact that I felt in my gut that was my career. My coach at the time said, listen, uh, you know, things are changing in swimming, World Cup circuit, there'll be money now, you can be a little more professional, don't you want to continue? And I just felt that it was the time to retire. Obviously, one wonders You afterwards. can't say why. N no, I just, uh, again, because my decision to go was prayerful. I, you know, I'd been in the States by then for almost nine years, and um, I never knew what life outside of swimming was. Um, my 99 season was the best of my career. 11 world records in 11 weeks, I don't know how it happened. Would have, it, and it was on par to do that and even better in 2000. But then there were some unforeseen circumstances, some I couldn't control the passing of a teammate, I was a little too involved mm. with that. Um, and some other decisions I made with regards to training. As you get older, you've got to adapt your training. And I don't think we did that successfully. So 2000 was one step forward, two steps back. It didn't end the way I would have hoped. If it was, if 99 was a reflection, it should have been another double gold, but it mm -hmm. wasn't. It was a bronze. I didn't retire because of that, but I felt at the time that was the end of the career. Also, the people I admired in the sport that were my, my peers had also sort of reached that age where they were retiring. Those years, we were still retiring quite early. I only announced my retirement, um, I think it was in March of 2001, because Sam Rim Sam and others had encouraged me not to. They kind of, mm -hmm. I suppose, hoped I would change my mind. And uh, my mom passed away very unexpectedly in May of 2001. And uh, when that happened, I, I realized this was the right time to retire. Because had I not, I would have been back in the States mm -hmm. and, or Canada, and I wouldn't have had that last you know, Christmas and few months with her. So you know, everything happens as it should. So how does one make that? I mean, it's such an enormous change. As you say, yeah. your life was swimming. Yeah. Now you cut that off. Mm. And then? Complicated. For many reasons. I mean, it wasn't as simple as I'm just retiring from swimming. You know, because I had been based in the States and Canada, to a large degree, I escaped the hype of mm. South Africa. The fame, I hate the word, but all of that and everything that goes with it. And I'm quite a private person, uh, despite the fact that I do a lot of public stuff, I think a little bit introverted. And so I was comfortable and safe in Canada. Then I moved back home. So there's the adjustment to retiring from swimming, the adjustment to being in South Africa, and at that stage there weren't other successes in swimming yet, so there was the dealing with the public. You know, just never ever felt comfortable up until probably a year or two or three ago, um, going out in public on my own, because you don't know, are people looking at you because you're looking funny, or do they recognize, you know what it's like. <laughs> and uh, African people are great. They don't have inhibitions. They come in and they chat and they ask the questions and they say what they want to say and then it's over and done. But especially conservative Afrikaans people, they don't want to intrude, but at the same time, they are still looking and it's, it, yeah, it's difficult. <laughs> so I just would hide away rather. And then on top of that, you know, you hear about all the crime in South Africa and I'm safe over there. So coming back here for about 10 years, that was very much top of mind awareness. Um, and then, of course, my mother's passing. And then uh, trying to go into the world of business is what did an you, adjustment. What did you do? What did you find to do? Well, at first, you know, everyone would expect you to continue in the sport of swimming. Mm. And I, at the time, you know, I think every swimmer has his or her struggles with the federation. Sometimes we are wrong. Sometimes the federation has their part. I think it's a bit of both. And so I had enough of swimming and I wanted nothing to do with the sport. 
And so I tried my hand at property and various other business ventures. And I was very fortunate once again, Zelda had, well, is an entrepreneur, so I'm, I was just kind of guided. But when you come out of a sport that's individual, you are the boss. So now I go into business, I have a business partner who knows way more than me, and I'm still trying to be the boss. So that in itself also had its own issues um, that, that I had to learn and work through. But long story short, by the time, I think it was after 2010, um, I was asked by one of the coaches to get involved with these fresh stroke swimmers and coach them. And then I was back on pool deck and really loved it and found that for the first time again, I had that gut feel. When I swam, I, I went on a gut feel. I knew what to do. And now again on pool deck, I just know what to do. And uh, out of that grew the swim clinics that we now present and camps, a lot of them in South Africa, but surprisingly last year, a lot of them more up in Africa. Part, part of those countries are expats. Tanzania and Kenya were more the local teams, um, Namibia as well. So it's a nice mix. And then all along, I've always been involved with the corporate speaking side, the motivational speaking. And then in addition to that, over the last, I think it was about four years, we've started adding other tools, let's say, into the program, brain-based learning development tools. So we do a lot of stuff in the schools with educators and still in the, in the corporate sector as well. So I'm loving it. I kind of found out I, I am a teacher at heart. And um, I love to motivate. You can be as tired and as down and whatever, and then suddenly somehow on the day when you've got to deal with teaching people and helping mm -hmm. people, you know, there's a new energy that comes. So I'm loving what I'm doing. I think probably more so than even in my swimming career, I feel more at ease and, and comfortable in my own skin and feel like I'm in the right place in my life right now. I suppose that also comes with age. And who are the people around you who support you? I think, obviously, my business partner, Zelda, who's now the big sister. Her whole family also, you know, we joke, I'm the adopted little ones in the <laughs> family, because they're in Pretoria, where I live. Um, my father and my two brothers are a strong support system still. There are a couple of other people. Uh, one of them is a past teacher of mine throughout my high school years, my other mother. Um, Louise Lemma, and she's now the head of Toti, uh, Toti High School. So I have people like that who mm. are a support system. Um, sadly, I think for my generation, those of us who are still in South Africa, our close friends coming out of school and college and stuff, in my case especially, they're also overseas. So, you know, you tend to, a lot of our work is over weekends, and uh, so it it becomes a little bit uh, isolated in that sense. Mm, it's hard to keep up the connections. Yeah, you kind yeah. of find this question of what are you doing now and trying to catch up over however many years. It's awkward. Um, yes. And you say you live in Pretoria now. Are you, uh, what's your home like? Okay, I kind of decided about three years ago, given the travel, that having a home and the schlep of the responsibility is too much. So I sold and then opted to rent, lock up and go. And then an opportunity came about to build with a whole bunch of other people on a farm outside of Pretoria. And I decided, why not? You know, I need a washing machine, and that's about it. And, but, you know, for, I grew up in a home with animals. And then going to the States and then living in Pretoria for over 10 years, um, it's almost about 18 years that I wasn't able to have any animals. And now being on the farm, there's 12 dogs. Um, <laughs> They keep me busy, I'm tired, <laughs> but it doesn't just belong to me, at least there's, you know, I can come and go as I please, and I like the bush, I like to escape in nature and just have my, my own time. And what makes your space yours? Do you have something special that you take with you? You mean when I travel? No, when you into your new home, what is, is there a, I'm not, a special couch? No. No? No. Uh, a lot of stuff is still in storage and uh, no, I think when I got used to when I was overseas to be quite minimalistic because mm. you know that you're traveling a lot. So I tended to carry that over. I suppose a bed is always important, you know, so you keep the <laughs> yes. same bed, the comfortable <laughs> mattress. Um, no, I just think moving now to an environment where I have more space, you know, the bush felt, the farm and the animals, that's, that's home. All of the very best. I hope Thank it is you. a very good year for you. Thank you. I'm sure it will be to you too. Thank you. Thanks.